So today we'll look into uh, performance related aspects in Snowflake. So we'll just see uh, how Snowflake differs from the traditional performance optimization uh, of a uh, yeah, any other previous generation SQL database engines, right? Like SQL Server, MySQL. So how the performance aspects in those traditional uh, database engines are different from uh, performance aspects in Snowflake. We'll try to get a, a glimpse of that. So to start with, first let's understand uh, what are the, uh, first of all, why do we need to uh, uh, do optimization, right? Performance optimization. So straightforward. So in a system like uh, Snowflake, uh, the more the, uh, the, the, whatever the computation power that you're using for your queries, uh, it uh, you're being cost, uh, you have to pay for that computation power. So let's say if your, uh, your query, let's say for example, is inefficient, right? And uh, instead of, uh, if your query uh, could have been finished in let's say under 10 seconds but it is taking up to uh, 5 minutes or 10 minutes right so you are using additional computation power because of those inefficiencies and that will lead to uh, extra costs which could have been saved so imagine uh, this at the enterprise level so when there are uh, numerous uh, employees who are working and uh, each employee making his or her own uh, a number of queries and uh, imagine uh, not only the queries that come from the employees like uh, or, or, or the users, right? But there will be a lot of automated queries as well. So a, a developer can just uh, create some queries and they, they will put these queries into automation to run every day. So if these queries that are running every day, they keep adding each day as the developer develops more and more queries. If they are inefficient, right? Your uh, this uh, inefficient cost due to ines these inefficiencies will uh, uh, skyrocket, right? So because of all those reasons, it is very important to optimize your queries when, you, especially when you are uh, uh, dealing with a cloud environment like Snowflake. So we will uh, look at the same thing today. How can we uh, make the queries efficient and how can we optimize the performance? So that is number one. And first, let's take a look at uh, how do we normally uh, 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 optimize performance in a traditional uh, SQL database engine systems, right? So like MySQL or SQL Server, these sort of systems. So one of the main uh, things that you may, may be already familiar with is adding indexes, right? So adding indexes and primary keys. So this, I'll, I'll not go in detail into all these things. We'll cover uh, today only related to Snowflake, but I'll give you a glimpse of what these means are. So indexes, uh, to just to give you a proper analogy for that, if say I, I give you a random book, right? And I'll ask you to find uh, some random word from that book. Hey, I'll give you a book of 500 pages and I'll ask you, hey, please find, where do you find the word? Uh, wherever you find the word silo, please note that page numbers. And what you'll do, you'll have to go through one by one of each page, one by one, and scan through the, for that word silo, and then uh, do this, uh, do the, do the, uh, do the uh, note the page numbers. Now, in, instead of that, if I give you a dictionary, right, a normal uh, typical English dictionary, and ask you to find a, a silo word, it'll, within a matter of a couple of seconds, you'll be able to, a few seconds, you'll be able to reach to the page where that word is there. Only because of well, what's the difference between the normal book and index? Because of they are arranged in a certain, certain manner that allows you to go there quickly. And this is exactly what indexes uh, uh, will do to a uh, tables in a SQL database engine. So uh, SQL database engine will make use of these indexes that you've created on tables and will know uh, when you write a query on that table, will make use of these indexes to get to the right data as quickly as possible. So that is the concept of indexes that we can normally use. Primary keys, they, they are not directly uh, 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 involved in creating uh, 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 performance optimization. Their main uh, objective is something different, but they indirectly uh, add to performance optimization as well. And there is something called as table partitions. So this is simple, I'll, uh, I'll keep it very short. So when you have a large amount of data, like one table which uh, spans across multiple GB of uh, data, in that case, instead of having all the data in a single table, you can create partitions. You can divide the table into smaller tables so that when you write a simple query, right, uh, only, which only uses a subset of the data, you're not, you will not end up scanning through entire table, that uh, multiple GB table, but you can just navigate it to the right partition where the data that your query needs locates, right? So the amount of 
data that your eventual eventually the database engine scans will be reduced so this is another technique that people normally use uh, creating table partitions and there is something called as uh, uh, query execution plan okay we'll talk about uh, uh, this uh, so uh, so every database engine will come with a something called as uh, optimizer okay this is not something that uh, happens in the back end this tool works in the back end so what this optimizer does is it's very simple once you write a query and submit it to execute it optimizer looks into this query first checks for any uh, validation errors so sometimes you will get a hey, in this line in this character this, this this is an error or i didn't understand this so that is uh, as a result of the optimizer validating the query once uh, optimizer validates the query then uh, in within the uh, query that you have wrote it will f- find out what is the best possible way uh, uh, i for, for me to execute this query that was submitted right that is the function of the optimizer now and now uh, optimizer will give you once it uh, uh, analyzes if you ask the optimizer it will also give you hey what is what are the steps that are involved in this query execution so which step did execute did it execute the optimizer execute first when which step did it execute last so all the plan can be retrieved uh uh from a, a any sql database engine so you can analyze this query execution plan and you can optimize your query accordingly uh should uh let's say a typical example would be uh let's say you're dealing with some big table okay and you're performing some uh transformations uh, or making some additional columns and uh, it, it, sometimes it will happen if you uh, uh perform the transformations at the very beginning of your query right very at the if it's happening at the very first stage and it'll it is if the transformation is generating lot of more data okay if your table has 10 columns but your transformations you are generating let's say uh, 15 more columns right and uh, of these 15 columns if there are uh, and this is the first step you are generating the in the first step itself you are generating 15 more columns and uh if there are 10 more steps you have to carry this additional data which was generated 15 more columns th- through all the next 10 steps so that is lot of data you are putting uh, uh, you have to retain it throughout all the steps so there could be a better way that you may you may have to uh, first f- finish up all the steps that don't require this data and then introduce these transformations at the right step so that it will be little more optimal so these kind of analysis can be done from the query execution plan and there is something called as table scans so a, a table scan is nothing but a, a, a situation where a, your query will have to read each and every single row in your table so that is called a full table scan sometimes it may not be full sometimes it it will also be a partial table scan depending upon the query so some of these table scans will happen with a purpose and they are fine completely fine to allow such a table scans but some of these table scans will happen unintentionally and which are not completely not needed or can be avoided uh whenever a table scan happens since it has to read every single row in the data 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 table it will obviously read up and read, uh, uh capture more computation power so if you can avoid such table scans also that will also lead to performance improvement so these are some of the things that we can uh, uh try to uh, do in a traditional system now uh, just to add little bit more on the query execution plan and a full table scan i'll quickly sh- show you some uh, demo in the uh, snowflake we'll just take a quick look at that and get back so let's say uh, so here here i have sample data in my snowflake okay that comes with the installation uh, sign up and i have two tables with that orders table and customer table okay and uh, what i'm doing here is i have just created join between these two tables with this two filters on a particular country and a particular market segment now if i run this particular query uh I just want to show you the query execution plan for this query. So I I get the result, but in the back end, if I want to go, so the op, uh, if if I want to click here and click here, it will take me to the query execution plan. So currently, okay, <laughs> uh, it's coming from the catch results. Okay, let me rerun it or change the value. Change this to seven. Uh, so go 
here yeah so here you can see the the plan uh, is this the best plan based on which the your optimizer had created as uh, to execute your query right so initially it has done two table scans the two, two tables which were involving and then for, for, we, uh, on each of those things it, the, whatever the filters or join criteria that we have created it is applied to those things and the finally the result and we can see on the top right hand side uh, we can see the table scans these are the most expensive of all the steps that were performed right the uh, it, it has been launched uh, shown shown in a uh, most expensive or least expensive order and you can also see the uh, number of rows that have been passed input and output by each step so th this is a query execution uh, 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 plan that in snowflake but the way to get to this query execution plan it will differ from uh, database engine to database engine uh, but they, they tend to provide almost similar information okay so here in this case we have written a simple query and we can see the, there are two table scans and the, in this case these two table scans are necessary for us to get the output but when you write a, a query which is multiple pages and very large queries involving multiple tables and transformations there is a chance sometimes unnecessary table scans could be uh, involved in your query plan so when you come here and look at each table scan uh, this query execution plan you'll be able to see which table scans are necessary and which table scans can be avoided so then you modify your query accordingly and avoid the unnecessary table scans thereby reducing the uh, uh, improving the query performance so this is the uh, one uh, aspect of it so now let me uh, go back to worksheet and uh, if I uh, do some group by element of it and uh, on the same thing, and this will have its own uh, query plan. Yeah, so, so this is also currently resulting. I, I just ran the query previously before coming. So therefore, uh, it is just instead of running it again, it is taking directly from the cache memory. Anyways, so you, you get the point. So let's go back to our presentation and uh, yeah. So this is a traditional base. And now let's come back to a performance aspect in Snowflake. So one of the interesting aspect of Snowflake is that uh, all these things that we have normally have to do in a traditional database, uh, you don't have to do that in Snowflake. The reason for that is uh, these things are automatically done by Snowflake for us. So normally these things are typically managed and done by database administrator. This is the job of a database administrator. But in Snowflake, uh, all these things are automatically taken care of and you don't have to worry about these things. Except for the query execution plan, there you can uh, uh, contribute a little, okay? Uh, look at and analyze. Now, if those things are taken care of, there are few other aspects that comes on that applies to a Snowflake sort of an environment uh, uh, where it'll uh, we can use these aspects to improve performance even a little, little bit more. So we'll go through uh, each. There are five main aspects. We'll cover these things in, in a very brief manner. The first is called creating a virtual warehouse. So virtual warehouse is nothing but a compute resource, right? How much compression power do you want? Uh, uh, whatever the compression power that you purchase is called a virtual warehouse. And uh, the first option is creating a dedicated virtual warehouse. So we'll go uh, we'll go into each of these things uh, uh, in, in detail. And the second option is called scaling up. Third, scaling out. Uh, and there is something called as uh, Snowflake, as we just saw the Snowflake use caching mechanism feature, right? So we can use that caching ability or feature of Snowflake to maximize performance. We'll see how we can do that. And there is something called as clustering uh, or cluster keys. We'll see using how each of these five aspects, how we can improve performance a little in Snowflake. So the first to start with a dedicated virtual warehouse. So think of a system like this. In the center, you have a database, okay? The core database where you, all your data is stored. And each of these, uh, uh, the processor symbol that you see is a virtual warehouse, okay? And in the organization, if you have a database, there are different roles like database administrator, there are BI and uh, reporting analysts, and there could be marketing people, there could be data scientists, there could be different roles. And the activities and tasks of these different roles will differ from each other. And the amount of computation power these people require will also differ from each other, each other. So instead of creating one virtual warehouse for all of them and all of their tasks, we can go ahead and create multiple warehouses with 
uh, 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 the warehouse properties uh, according to the needs of that particular role so let's say for example uh, data scientists they will do some uh, pretty uh, complex modeling related aspects right in that case they would need more computation power than people who are involved in bi who will just maybe read the data and show it to into convert into visualization right so that's why a warehouse for data, designed for data scientists will have more computation power when compared to people uh, who are in bi or data set administrators and likewise you can uh, so, so th- there will be some cases where uh, uh, etl and el uh, data loading uh, related aspects those also come under bi but sometimes they will be heavy sometimes they will not be heavy so you have to really understand what are each role and that role related activities and then create the warehouses accordingly so this is one uh, better way we can uh, uh, say uh, that, that that can help you optimize your performance so so that these people don't feel lag or uh, if you give, if you give the same high completion powers to all the less load that is required then you are causing inefficiencies and that will lead to costs so this is one of the approach that you can follow and second there is something called as scaling up and down now uh, think of a situation where uh th- this is basically so what do you mean by scaling up or down is nothing but increasing the warehouse size okay if your computation power you have uh, 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 if you have taken for small okay the, in, in snowflake terminology computation power comes in different sizes extra small small medium etc let's say if you have taken computation power of warehouse of small size then uh you can change this up or down either you can go to medium or extra small depending upon the workload let's say for example if you have noticed a specific time uh, during the day where uh, the uh, lot of complex queries will run on your system okay uh, typically some of the etl task will be very complex the data loading uh, tasks some of them not all of them some of the etl task will be very complex okay and uh, let, let's say these etl operations are happening at the end of the day from 2 pm to 4 pm to update all the databases every day right and these are very complex operations if you, uh, if they are very complex operations then you can set up hey during this time just uh, change my data uh, base data where virtual warehouse size from small to medium or medium to extra large therefore these etl operations are performed without any interruption and they are uh, performed quickly without any inefficiencies right so this is what is called scaling up and down and once those operations are performed you can scale them down accordingly for a normal usage right so uh, and keep in mind there is a term called scaling up this is what we call as scaling up so, and this is normally used for query complexity uh, and not Uh, when there are more number of users that's a completely different thing okay and uh, when we have let's say more number of using during the time okay let's say uh, early morning office hours let's say all people are logging in your database and then at simultaneously multiple people are querying lot of queries in that case you have to do something called as scaling out so here you are not increasing the size of the warehouse but you are increasing the number of warehouses this is called scaling out uh here in uh, we have a warehouse called uh, size s uh, of size s and instead of increasing the size s to medium or extra large we are increasing the number of size s warehouses there uh, and this sort of a uh, uh, option scaling out will enable when there are more concurrent users who are uh, querying your database at a time so this is a third option which we can use and this option is not uh, uh, some uh, is one of the important features of uh, snowflake is that this can be automatically taken care of so you don't have to do anything at all this can be automatically taken you just have to set up hey uh, in this warehouse there there is something called as multi clustering warehouse this is a specific type of warehouse that you can create and set up uh, hey the minimum number of clusters that can, this warehouse can have is one and maximum it can go up until is 10 so depending upon the traffic or number of users that are querying on that warehouse snowflake will dynamically activate more more uh, 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 warehouses up until 10 and it will automatically uh, scale down uh, uh, turn off the uh, uh, cluster nodes if they are not used for at least some 5 to 10 minutes of time uh, 
so this is automatically taken care of without any manual intervention so this is one of the key selling points of snowflake white to white became very popular so uh, and then there is, so this is a quick difference between scaling up and scaling out we scale up that is increasing the virtual warehouse size when there is a more complex query to solve we scale out we increase the number of virtual warehouse the when there are more concurrent queries or users uh, working at a parallel time so the quick difference there can remember and finally there is something called as uh, finally but yeah something called as caching caching we have just seen uh, how when i run a query it is resulting the data from a, a cached memory right so uh, what uh, this is also done automatically in snowflake so if two people if you have run a query at least two times that query results are saved in snowflake for about a time period of 24 hours okay and uh, either that or if 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 the in underlying data for that query is changed then automatically snowflake will recognize that with the help of metadata and it will know when should when it should return a cached result or when it should run a, a query once again which when it should not result from a cached result so it will check uh, if the data changed then it will return the query or else it will save the uh, cached results for 24 hours and after that it will return the query again so this is this is caching is also done automatically by uh, snowflake but what you can do is we can make use of this feature to maximize the uh, benefits that we get from this caching uh, let's say for example uh, early morning uh, all people employees come to your office and all of them because of some reason they run the same query for of uh, in order to get updated on some information okay and what you can try to do there is uh, uh you can put all those people to query from a single warehouse okay and a single warehouse that way whoever the person first executes that query only then that query will be executed uh, in reality and it will take that uh, whatever the query uh, takes let's say it take some 2 minutes okay only during the first time it will take 2 minutes but every other person when they come and execute that query after that it will not take 2 minutes it will just take near 1 second or 2 seconds and this will the cache results that way uh, you can save a lot of computation power you don't have to uh, execute it all, all for every person or every, every time they run the execute query right this is a very important case and uh, and currently in our one of our clients uh, they use something called as uh, looker okay and uh, uh, looker and we have created multiple dashboards on this looker and this uh, it's a bi tool this looker connects to snowflake for accessing the data now every day lot of people there is a dashboard called company kpi dashboard a lot of users from the company come to this dashboard and refresh the dashboard okay and this is a very heavy dashboard very big dashboard and uh, uh, you can uh, uh, see when a lot of people come and use this uh, dashboard this caching can be very helpful there so it will not refresh the dashboard every time a person can come and uh, 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 so let's let's say if it takes 5 minutes to refresh the dashboard it will be very time saving uh, using this caching techniques so that is one way you can improve the performance and finally there is something called as cluster uh, cluster data clustering and cluster keys so uh, let's uh, quickly understand something about this cluster keys and then come back to uh, these points uh, let me okay so here uh, we are in the snowflake documentation if you see on the left hand side this is a typical date let's let's take this is a uh, some sample data that you have data table four columns and some n number of rows and on the fourth column we have the month field year and month field uh, or uh, yeah <coughs> date field and uh, so snowflake uh, does something called as a uh, micro partition so what it does is we have earlier seen right uh, creating table partitions is one of the good ways to uh, improve the performance right and snowflake does that with the concept called micro partitions so your entire table will be split up into smaller segments and each of the segment is called micro partition and and some part of the data will go into each micro partition now data clustering comes into play let's say for example on the top uh if i okay let's go to another example uh, yeah here the same same case but a uh, uh, 
get you suited for example yeah so if you see in this micro partition if i ask you to uh, give me the data uh, hold on yeah give me the data related to all the uh, uh, give me all the rows where my date field is 11 to okay what you have to do is even though you have created this multiple partitions snowflake has no choice but to scan each and every partition to look for that data we can see this one uh, 112 is lying everywhere across it it doesn't know uh, 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 which partition to skip or which partition to read it has to by all means go through all the partitions specifically looking for that uh, date now this is where data clustering comes into picture okay what clustering does is it will sort the macro partitions in such a way uh let's say for example in at the bottom after uh clustering what it will do is it will sort based on a certain column here in this case date so all the uh same dates are put first so 11 to all of them are occupied in the first two partitions and then it will goes to 113 11 and then 114 and 115 right so this is called clustering so in in a in a simple words just uh sorting the data in these micro partitions based on a certain column and this column whichever we use to sort is called cluster keys and here if you have to ask the same query hey give me all the data uh, uh where date belongs to 11 to snowflake immediately recognizes hey only these two partitions have 11 to data and uh, i don't have to read any other partitions outside this or at least the uh, uh, these two that doesn't have this 11 to data so instead of reading all the micro partitions it will only read data from these two micro partitions and uh, will give you uh, 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 the required data so now this may be looking uh, uh, very uh, sim- uh, simple in terms uh, but typically uh, a table will have thousands if not millions of uh, micro partitions okay for large tables and when you have to uh, see the difference scanning millions of micro partitions and just a few of micro par- of those millions of partitions it will make a translate to lot a lot of performance improvement uh, in getting the query results so this is what we call a uh, clustering and uh, uh, cluster so clustering and the column based on which we sort is called cluster keys and uh, this this is micro partitioning three concepts in software and uh, so this is what we do here we i have already explained what a cluster key is and uh, clustering uh yeah so this snowflake there are a couple of things you need to keep in mind about snow uh, snowflake clustering so this is also done automatically you don't have to do anything uh, snowflake automatically when you load the data into a table it will cluster it uh, uh, based on a certain fields but what it doesn't know is where you need to intervene is that uh, it doesn't know which column you need to cluster it on okay uh, so what is the right column to cluster it on what is the optimal column or cluster keys that is where your expertise comes into play and you have to select the right columns or like the right cluster keys based on which snowflake should cluster once you have selected those columns all the clustering will happen automatically and there are a couple of things that we need to keep in mind let's say uh, once you have created a cluster keys it not necessary that this cluster keys uh, 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 we have seen that correct order in date right in ascending order that order might change when you keep loading more and more data on every day basis into this table okay there will be a lot more data coming in there will be new partitions that will be created or maybe in the old partitions only some new data will be inserted so whatever it is this once you have clustered the table this clustering order may get inefficient when you keep loading more and more data in a in a certain while so what you have to do is that after a certain while you just have to recluster the table so that it's all, all whatever the inefficiencies that have been uh, in, included because of the data loading activities all that will be uh, removed and it will be perfectly clustered back again so uh, so th- th- that is about the data clustering which is a very powerful tool uh, uh, to uh, performance optimization and how do we uh, select what co- columns we need to use as cluster keys that comes from uh, answering a simple questions like 
uh, whatever the columns that you frequently use in where filters okay under where clause those are the columns that becomes obvious choice first choice uh, if not that you, uh, not necessary you can have to uh, use one column only for cluster keys we can use multiple columns in a single table uh, uh, and specify them to cluster based on those multiple columns number one and if you are using certain columns that are frequently used in joining with other tables right uh, uh, you can use those columns as well uh, in your uh, as clustering keys only thing to keep in mind is that uh, uh, not all the columns that specify the above uh, that uh, satisfy the above three conditions can be eligible uh, for clustering keys sometimes let's say for example you have orders table and there is a column called order id okay and each order id is unique and it's a hexacode uh, 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 number that doesn't make any sense right just for identification if you take that and make it as a cluster key it doesn't make any sense okay it will not be able to uh, sort uh, it will it will definitely do the clustering but it will not result in any performance improvement right so there is one thing that you need to check always is check the cardinality of the column that you are uh, making is uh, a cluster key cardinality is nothing but how many distinct values are there in that column right so for a uh, order id field it will be uh, a very large number high level, very large cardinality and that is not a Uh, normally when there is a large cardinality or a very small cardinality they typically tend to be uh, less uh, effective to bring results through clustering so for uh, for example of the small cardinality will be a gender field male and female okay so there is only two values if you cluster on that a snowflake will definitely do clustering on that but it will not yield in uh, uh, good uh, performance improvements so you need to keep all those things in mind and then choose a clustering key and then You have to cluster the tables accordingly. Let me see. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think th- uh, that would be all from my side. Uh, if you have any questions, I can take them. Uh, else, we can close the session. There can be clustering or mix of two columns like date and type. Yes, you can do that. Multiple columns, you can do that. Not multiple columns. Basically, what I need to do, hmm. I need to do a clustering uh, for a similar data type on similar date. So, what do you mean by similar data type? Like, uh, if we take samples for store data, huh. so for furniture, all those furniture which are sold in same uh, in the same month. Okay. So, can we do a clustering that way, like uh, merging two columns and then doing clustering? Okay, okay. Yeah, you can definitely do that as well, but you have to assess if it uh, it it it's also depends upon the context. The context. So if it uh, in your data is in such a way that it will result in good uh, performance improvements, you can definitely do that. It, there, you will not find any issue. You can perform literally theoretically clustering on any column, any column that you give. You can do do that, but the question becomes. is uh, is it yielding in uh, better performance results or not so that will only you will only understand from uh, uh, seeing what kind of data are we dealing with or how big the table is etc uh, uh, etc et so, but you can definitely do